Our next speaker this morning is Brother Danny Douglas. Uh, many of you know Danny. I certainly have a, a greater appreciation for Danny. I'd love to hear him preach. He's a native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. He's been preaching the gospel on a regular basis since 1977. Um, Danny, you don't look that old. <laughs> He's uh, served at uh, the Churches of Christ in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Virginia, and, and uh, certainly has done work, mission work overseas in Ukraine, United Kingdom. He's uh, involved in mission work in the Lord's Church in the Philippines. Uh, he's been blessed with a, a, a really lovely wife, uh, Larnie, and certainly uh, look forward to seeing her maybe again in the future, Lord willing, and uh, two precious children. So. Brother Danny is going to be speaking to us this morning as we continue our theme on the New Testament church and counterfeit churches, and he's going to be speaking on what is the Baptist church, and I think we will find out real quick what category that falls into. Brother Danny, come and speak to us. Okay. Thank you for the good number that we have this morning. Appreciate the kind words by Brother Jack. As Brother Guy and Woods used to say, introductions are nice to smell, just don't swallow them. <laughs> and uh, appreciate the prayer by Brother Ruffner and, and uh, the good singing by Brother Wayne that he let us in. I want to say I'm thankful to the Lord to be here, to have this privilege. I'm certainly thankful for the Lord's Church at Spring for Brother Brown, the faithful and godly man and preacher that he is, and for the wonderful elders here, and Brother Roth, Brother Stevens, and Brother Cone. And I'm also thankful this week to be able to say with Brother and Sister Brown again, I'm certainly thankful for their friendship and their hospitality in the Lord, and love and appreciate them very much. I do want to say this uh, before I get started this morning, since he is one of the elders. Uh, Brother Cone, we were in a hurry this morning, pulled in the parking lot next to your van, and the wind was blowing, and I opened my door. So if you go out there and find a little mark on your van, I, I want you to know that one of the children didn't do it. It was me. But I had some help with the wind, I think. But anyway, uh, I tried to get it off my hand, but yeah. couldn't complete <laughs> it. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> I wanted to clear that up. <clears throat> but this morning, uh, we're dealing with what is the Baptist church. We know that the Lord's church is that which he established and all denominations, including the Baptist Church, were founded by men and based on men's doctrines. The Lord promised to build his one and only church, as has been referenced before in this lectureship. Upon this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Matthew 16, verse 18. And we know that the Lord is the head of his church, and he is the head of the body, the church, Colossians 1, 18. And there is one body, Ephesians 4, verse 4. To learn of the supreme value of the Lord's church, we read in Ephesians 5, 25, that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In Acts 20, verse 28, the great charge that Paul gave to the Ephesian elders at Miletus Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And one thing we need to be reminded of is that any and every religious body except for the Lord's body of Christ is in competition with the blood-bought church of Christ. And everything that has been established that's not the Lord's church is in opposition to the body of Christ. And that's one thing we need to remember about denominations. Although we do want to deal with them in love and meekness, we still have to be bold and stand for that truth that these religious bodies, not the Lord's church, are in contrast to that which Jesus 
died to establish. Religious historians credit John Smythe and Thomas Helwes as the early uh, beginners of the Baptist movement in the early 1600s. However, there are several statements made by both Helwes and Smythe that lead one to believe that they were closer to the Lord's church and the New Testament than to Baptist doctrine. And in fact, it even we even wonder if perhaps they might have been members of the body of Christ. Now, Brother Ken Chumley informed me yesterday that he does have several copies of Brother Keith Sisman's book, Traces of the Kingdom, here. And I would encourage us, if possible, to get a copy of that book because he does have some very valuable history along this line. And I'm going to use some of that here in the lecture this morning. But uh, one such statement that John Smythe makes, um, and I found this in uh, a work by William J. McLaughlin, and this can be found on the internet. It came out in 1911. McLaughlin was, of course, of the Baptist religion, but it's a very valuable work in as much insofar as Baptist history is concerned. In this, he has several confessions and statements of faith uh, regarding Baptist history from the early days and even on down to later times. And one of these was made by John Smythe in a short confession of faith, it is called, signed by him and 41 others. And one thing he says here is, Therefore, the baptism of water leadeth us to Christ, to his holy office in glory and majesty, and admonisheth us not to hang only upon the outward, but with holy prayer to mount upward and to beg of Christ, the good thing signified. Of course, the typical preacher in the Baptist church today would oppose what they call baptismal regeneration or the fact that one has to be baptized in order to come to Christ. But this is exactly the thing that Smythe is teaching, that by baptism one reaches Christ. And of course, that is what the Bible teaches. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And, of course, that indicates regeneration, the new life in Christ. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And then, of course, uh, to Nicodemus, Jesus said in John 3, 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And, of course, the kingdom of God is that new creation, that is, the Lord's spiritual creation, wherein the Lord's people are, the church, and wherein all the regenerated are. And thus, uh, we're going to read some things later that indicate the uh, defiance toward baptism that those have in the Baptist church, many of them, in their derogatory, they refer to it as baptismal regeneration. However, when we look at Titus chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Well, here the apostle Paul inspired the Spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as his apostle refers to the washing of regeneration. Now, no gospel preacher or faithful member of the Lord's church has ever taught that water is that which saves us. However, water is that means by which we obey God because 
Just as Naaman was commanded to go into the river Jordan and dip seven times in 2 Kings 5, that he might be cleansed of his leprosy, it was God that healed Naaman of his leprosy, but the water was that means whereby Naaman was to obey what the prophet told him to do. In a like manner, when we go into the water, it's not the water that heals us, but it is when we go into the water that we are cleansed by the blood of Christ. As Acts twenty two sixteen teaches, and when Ananias said to Saul, And now why tearest thou arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Well, we learn in Revelation 1, 5, that Christ loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So it is when we obey the Lord in baptism, predicated upon hearing and believing, repentance and confession, that we are cleansed by the blood of Christ. But now, furthermore, Thomas Helwes, another who is uh, noted, supposed to be one of the forerunners of the Baptist denomination, he drew up and printed a confession of 27 articles in 1611, a declaration of faith of English people remaining in Amsterdam in Holland. And he says here, uh, McLaughlin says, this has generally been recognized as the earliest Baptist confession. Now, when I read this statement, you think about what a great statement this is against the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, or also known as the impossibility of apostasy. What a great statement hell was made, and how contrary it is to the Baptist church as we now know it today in their teaching. He says in Article 7 that men may fall away from the grace of God, Hebrews 12, 15. And Hebrews 12, 15 says, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That men may fall away from the grace of God, Hebrews 12, 15, and from the truth which they have received and acknowledged, chapter 10, verse 26 of Hebrews, after they have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and of the powers of the world to come, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and after they have escaped from the filthiness of the world, may be entangled again and therein and overcome, 2 Peter 2, 20, that a righteous man may forsake his righteousness and perish, Ezekiel 18, verses 24 and 26. And therefore let no man presume to think that because he hath or had once grace, therefore he shall always have grace. But let all men have assurance that if they continue unto the end, they shall be saved, let no man then presume, but let all work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Have you ever heard anybody make a greater statement against that false doctrine than Thomas Helvis did? That was a great statement. Now, I'd like to read Ezekiel 18, verse 24 and 26, because perhaps we don't go to this as much as some of the other passages against the false doctrine of once saved, always saved. But the prophet Ezekiel said, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. And then verse 26, when a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. And so that's a great statement by the prophet Ezekiel. And of course, this man Elvis cited this against that false doctrine. Now, I would like to look at some material that Brother Sisman has in his book regarding John Smythe. 1606, March 24. This night at midnight, Elder John Morton baptized John Smythe, vicar of Gainsborough in the River Don. 
It was so dark, we were obliged to have torch lights. Elder Brewster prayed. Mr. Smith made a good confession, or Mr. Smythe, walked to Epworth in his cold clothes, but received no harm. The distance was over two miles. All of our friends were present to the triune God be praise. Now today we know that in the Baptist church, people are taught that you believe on the Lord and you're saved. And then in some time in the future, it may be a few more days or next month or a few weeks, then we will have a general baptizing and baptize everybody at one time. Does this sound like what Smythe and these people were teaching? Not at all. It sounds more like Acts 16 when the Philippian jailer and his household were baptized after midnight, according to verse 25 and verse 31 to 34. At the same hour of the night, he was baptized and his household. And uh, this shows the urgency of baptism on the part of John Smythe that this man was willing to be baptized at midnight and walk in his cold clothes. I knew a lady in the church in Virginia one time that told me that when she was, I believe, 15 years old, she was baptized in the Ohio River. They had to break the ice in the wintertime to baptize her. Now this shows the urgency of baptism. But according to baptism, well, you could just wait to spring. You can already be saved and be baptized later as an outward sign of inward renewal to show that you've already been saved. But according to these actions, it indicates otherwise. Now, at the beginning of the Baptist church, we date more toward the mid-1600s than the early 1600s because of these statements of faith. We know that in England that uh, Calvinism had taken great root by this time and that the Baptist movement had crystallized around this time, the mid-1600s. A large denomination with many divisions. As Frank Mead says in his handbook of the denominations, that it is a major Protestant force. In recent years, it is reported that in North America, there are 33 million members of the Baptist Church and 41 million worldwide. And of course, there are many branches and divisions of the Baptist Church, hundreds of them. And I'm not going to go into all of them at this time, but I would say they would probably number into the hundreds. I didn't count them all. I don't even believe that we know of all of them down this point in time. But in the book, there is a list of several of them, and also the many uh, councils, conventions, conferences, and associations that they belong to. Now, they claim that the inspiration and trustworthiness of the Bible is their sole rule of life. This is their claim. However, when you see the various confessions and statements of faith made, this calls us into question. Why do you have to have, for example, the Baptist manual if all that you're trusting in is the Bible? If all that we need is the Bible, then anything less is too little, anything more is too much, and anything else is the wrong thing. But the statement by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 to 17, indicates to us that we do not need creed books, manuals, catechisms, confessions, and statements of faith, because all we need is the Scripture. He wrote to young Timothy, and that from a child, thou hast known the holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. They also claim, as we do in the Lord's church, the autonomy of the local congregation. This is their claim that they make. However, again, when we read about the many associations that they belong to, 
and conventions such as the Southern Baptist Convention and the conferences that they have when they meet together and discuss their positions and their stances on different things, it calls us into question. And no doubt we can very confidently say that in following these meetings and these gatherings and these associations rather than the Bible, they forfeit local church autonomy. Now, let's look at the Lord's church for a moment. What about the Lord's church? Did the Lord's church have its beginning in England and Holland? Did the Lord's church begin in the 1600s? No, friends, we know very plainly from the Bible, from the prophets, that the Lord's church was to begin in Jerusalem in Zion. In Isaiah, the second chapter, at the end of verse 3, For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's also in Micah, the fourth chapter, in verse 2. And then we read in Luke 24, verse 47, Jesus, And that repentance and remission of sin should be priests in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. It was to begin at Jerusalem. And we see the fulfillment of that promise in Acts 2.38, when in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, Peter commanded the Jews to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there we see repentance and remission of sins preached in Jerusalem. Moreover, the Lord commanded them to go and wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with the promise of my Father from on high there at the end of Luke chapter 24. And in Acts chapter 1, in verse 4, before his ascension in verses 9 to 11, we read concerning the Lord's teaching to his disciples, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then they ask him, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? In verse 6. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the promise you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, under the uttermost part of the earth. And then we read of his ascension in verses 9 through 11, and in verse 12 they obeyed the Lord. Then they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem about a Sabbath day's journey. Then some days Ten days later, the promise of the Father did come upon them. And we read in Acts 2, verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we see that the power would come with the coming of the Holy Ghost. But what else would come? In Mark 9, verse 1, Jesus said, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they shall see the kingdom of God come with power. And so when would the kingdom come? When would the church come? It would come with power. It would come when the Holy Ghost came upon the disciples and when the gospel of Christ would be preached for the first time. And then this brings across another point. And that is that many in the Baptist church are filled with the premillennial doctrine. They believe the kingdom of God as such has not yet come. But we see that if we believe what John taught, the kingdom is at hand, Matthew 3, 2. And what Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. And we believe these prophecies concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God coming with power, and the fulfillment in Acts 2. We know that the kingdom of God has already come. Moreover, 
We read that the Colossians were in the kingdom as all are who have been born of water to the Spirit, John 3, 5. In Colossians 1, 13, Paul speaks of God who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. John and those in the seven churches of Asia, that is the seven churches of Christ in ancient Asia in Revelation 1, 9, they were in the kingdom of God as well as all today who obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I would like to turn to one of the foremost authorities among the Baptists. And that is the Standard ba Manual for Baptist Churches by Edward T. Hiscox. He states, Baptists especially claim to have no authoritative creed except the New Testament. It is common, however, for the churches to have formulated statements of what are understood to be the leading Christian doctrines printed and circulated among their members. So in other words, we're going to emphasize certain doctrines of the Bible above others. And my friends, this is what constitutes human teaching. When we elevate one doctrine above another. Now we all know that faith is important. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, Hebrews 11 and verse six. But to emphasize faith to the exclusion of obedience is not to teach true biblical faith. And it is to come up with the doctrines and commandments of men which turn from the truth, Titus 1.14. And uh, while we may emphasize faith, and it's important to emphasize faith, to exclude other things that the Bible teaches is error. In Hebrews 5, verse 89, we read of Christ, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Thus, the beginning, the place, practices, and doctrines of the Baptist church show conclusively that it is a denomination and not the Lord's church. But I would like to read here a statement that Hiscox made in the Baptist manual that's a very good statement. He made this in response to the widespread practice of infant baptism in Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. He says, and yet it was not instituted by Christ, nor practiced by his apostles, nor known in the primitive churches, and has neither sanction nor recognition in the word of God. Now that's a great statement there regarding infant baptism that it's not biblically authorized. It is ironic, however, that those of the Baptist denomination do not recognize this same principle regarding many of the things that they do, that they have no authority for, such as mechanical instruments of music and worship, uh, missionary societies, choirs, exalted religious titles, and other various unscriptural practices that they teach and uphold. Obviously, he recognized here the point regarding infant baptism that we must have the authority of Christ for what we do in the New Testament, but yet he did not apply this principle to other things that are done in religion, and that is in the Baptist church. Moreover, the converse of his statement must also be true. If an action was instituted by Christ, and practiced by his apostles and known in the primitive churches and mentioned and sanctioned by the word of God, then how can we be right to neglect or oppose such a practice? And this is exactly what they do regarding baptism for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. And meeting on the first day of the week to take the Lord's Supper, Acts 20, verse 7, and other things. It is interesting to note that in respect to salvation, that his cox has nothing at all to say about New Testament baptism. But he says this, we believe the scriptures teach that the salvation of sinners is holy of grace and that justification is bestowed, quote, solely through faith in Christ, end of quote. It always sounds a lot like Ruby Shelley right there. 
We wonder if uh, Shelley didn't read that and teach some of the things that he has. But let's pay particular attention to this statement that he made. We believe the scriptures teach that in order to be saved, men must be regenerated or born again. That regeneration consists in giving a holy disposition of mind that is affected in a manner above our comprehension by the Holy Spirit in connection with divine truth so as to secure our voluntary obedience to the gospel and that its proper evidence appears in the holy fruits of repentance, faith, and newness of life. Now, there are two reasons that it is important to study this statement in view of the Baptist Church. One is because it represents circular reasoning. A second is because it is Calvinistic in nature. Now regarding circular reasoning, have you ever tried to pin a person down of the Baptist religion steeped in Baptist doctrine on a certain point? You find yourself going around and around in circles. Circular reason. That's what Hiscox does here. We can understand why many of the members are caught up in fallacious reasoning because of the uh, leaders of this denomination and the way they teach and reason. This statement indicates Calvinistic nature of Baptist beliefs. Hiscox says that one must necessarily receive, that's a key word there, the holy disposition in order to be regenerated by direct action of the Holy Spirit. Although this is said to be done in connection with divine truth, it is still the case that man is passive in receiving that which is necessary in an order to secure voluntary obedience. He calls it voluntary obedience. Nevertheless, the New Testament teaches that man must hear the gospel of Christ and then he must believe and obey it. For example, with the Corinthians in Acts 18.8, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized in that order. Moreover, we note that Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. But now let's think about this disposition that he mentions here. The disposition to receive the word and obey it. It is not dependent upon a direct working of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit works through the word to convict men of sin and to lead them to obey God. Jesus promised that when the Spirit comes, he will reprove or convict the world. There in John 16, verse 7. And this he did when he brought the gospel down, according to 1 Peter 1, 12. And beginning on Pentecost in Acts 2, we have an example of that. When Peter preached to them, and they were pricked in their heart and said, Men and brethren, what should we do? Acts 2, 37. They were convicted by the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. It is only through God's word that the Holy Spirit works to convict men of sin and to lead them unto salvation. We note that to emphasize man's active and not passive role responding to the will of God, Peter urged them to save yourselves from this untoward generation, Acts 2, verse 40. Now, is that active or is that passive? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added, that same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls, verse 41. According to Baptist doctrine, man must passively receive something from the Holy Spirit in order to, quote, secure our voluntary obedience to the gospel. This would make obedience to the gospel anything but voluntary. Moreover, the Baptist doctrine would get the cart before the proverbial horse. According to the standard Baptist manual, the evidence of man's regeneration, quote, appears in the holy fruits of repentance, faith, 
and newness of life. Yet according to the New Testament, these are preconditions in order to be saved, in order for one to be regenerated and to have newness of life. For example, they were told on Pentecost to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. And when we are buried with Christ in baptism, we rise to walk in newness of life according to Romans 6 and verse number 4. Of course, Baptists are to one degree or another Calvinistic. And we probably heard many times the acronym of the word TULIP to remind us of the five basic tenets of Calvinism. There is T, total depravity. Man is born in sin and therefore totally depraved from birth. U, unconditional election. Man is either elected or chosen to be saved or not, and there are no conditions by which this predetermined state may be changed. Or L, limited atonement. That is, atonement or salvation is only for a limited number. That certainly runs contrary to what the Hebrews writer said, that he, Christ, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. And then I, irresistible grace, irresistible or invincible calling, the idea is that if a person is chosen to be one of God's unconditional elect, then he cannot resist the call of God or that he is called by the grace of God and there is nothing to do, that he can do to resist it. And then the P, the perseverance of the saints, or as we commonly call it, once in grace, always in grace, or once saved, always saved, or one cannot so sin as to be eternally lost. Again, let it be emphasized that when it comes to these basic tenets, that in these various and many uh, branches of the Baptist church, there are differing degrees of Calvinism found. But all hold to these to one degree or another. For example, the following words or such words can be heard over the Baptist Bible Hour broadcast. Quote, you have never had to sit down and teach your child to make some mistakes, do some wrong things, to exaggerate, lie a little bit, rebel and disobey. We are all born without fallen, sinful nature. I heard a Baptist preacher on the radio say one time, he was evidently preaching in an auditorium like this one. He said, the worst sinners in this building are back there in that nursery. Isn't that something? According to Baptist doctrine, little children are of the kingdom of darkness. That's not what Jesus said. He said, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. If Calvinism is true, and if man would inherit the guilt of sin by nothing that he ever did, then would the words of Isaiah be true, who said of Jehovah that he is a just God and a Savior? Isaiah 45, 21. We know that man does not inherit sin. Now, as we close this morning, I want to read one more quote. Hiscock says, We believe the scriptures teach that such as are truly regenerate, being born of the Spirit, will not utterly fall away and perish, but will endure until the end. This is probably the most popular tenet of Calvinism within the Baptist church. Once saved, always saved. While some may deny the idea that little children are sinners, by and large, they would say, well, this is true. If you are truly born again, if you are truly one of God's children, you cannot fall away. Obviously, there are many scriptures that would contradict this idea. One of them is written by Paul in Galatians 5, 4, concerning those who would be justified by the law. He said, you are fallen from grace, Galatians 5 and verse 4. My friends, as we close this morning, the reason that denominations arise is that men trust their feelings and their ideas 
over God. And we know, according to Jesus, that this constitutes vain religion. But in vain do they worship me, Jesus said, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men, Matthew 15 and verse 9. Moreover, elevating one thing in the Bible above others or putting one thing, one scripture in the Bible in competition to another scripture ends up with the truth not being taught at all. It ends up with a false doctrine. And that's what we see in the Baptist church and in many other denominations. As we close, let us all do, as Paul said in Acts 20, verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God, or all the counsel of God. It is only by abiding in the doctrine of Christ, the totality of the New Testament, that we can have the Father and the Son. John said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Danny. It's a, a good lesson there. Certainly, um, the denominations as a whole are one of the greatest tools that Satan has and uses against the church, the Lord's church, and Baptist doctor, uh, Baptist uh, church being one of the larger one of the larger ones. It's a it's a very uh, interesting religion when you begin to observe it. It was the, it was the religion of my uh, mother's family, if you will, on my mother's side. And in the uh, closing months of her life, as I was trying to study with her, she told me uh, that uh, she was comfortable with her religion, her beliefs, I think was her exact phrase. And I says, well, of course you are. <laughs> uh, because uh, in, in her mind, uh, she had uh, let Jesus in her heart in a, as a young child. And of course, she hadn't darkened the, the door of a Baptist church in you know 30 plus years, but that was a cup of comfort to her. It was good enough for her mother. It was good enough for her and uh, was never able to persuade her differently. But watching these guys dance uh, at a funeral is what gets me because they can have a rank center there in the casket, but they're going to preach him into heaven. And I uh, did that with my uh, uncle, uh, obviously with Baptist, my family, been to a few funerals, who took his own life. Uh, actually went out behind a field early one morning right behind Dance Town, USA in Houston with a shotgun and took his own life. And uh, the, uh, the Baptist preacher got up and said, um, I know that many people teach that suicide is a sin, but I'm not one of those. <laughs> and he proceeded to preach my uncle into heaven, uh, to, uh, saying that he had uh, taken Jesus into his heart, he had been saved, and uh, thus he was, uh, he was saved now, even though he was dead in that casket. And the only example that I can remember him giving of my uncle, of any good works he did, was how hard he worked on a clothing driver clothing drive of some sort for some poor people but um, absolutely ruined a good gospel song for me because every time I hear it now I think of that funeral it's uh, on the road again by Willie Nelson anyway <laughs> that's what they started and ended with <laughs> <laughs>